I'm going to begin with just a scripture tonight, and um, if you have your Bibles, you can read along with us, or there'll be words on the screen here or online, you can see those as well. But let's just begin reading at 1 John chapter number 2, verse 15 through 17, it says this, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. Father, thank you tonight for your word. God, we're just not getting into your word tonight. Our prayer is it would get into us, God, that, that you would just speak to us tonight as we surrender to that. God, have your will and your way, God, tonight in our hearts and in our lives. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. First John chapter 2 reminds us not to be lovers of this world, right? To, to not love the world maybe too much or more than we love God. It's okay to love things, right? And it's certainly okay to express our love for things. I, 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 how many of you like to be loved? I certainly like to be loved, and I like to be told that I'm loved. I've got to be honest, though. I'm not sure in my entire life have I ever had a t-shirt that said, I love you. But tonight, Allie, would you just stand up? Because Allie has a t-shirt that says, I love Kelly. And so I think the, the camera might catch that for those who can't see it. Um, Allie, if you didn't know, is the president and founding member of my fan club. She's also the only member, uh, but she's a good one. But I do appreciate her love and support. Well, we're so glad you're here with us tonight. The holidays are over and we are back to the grind, right? Back at it. I got to go home for the holidays and uh, always enjoy getting to go home. Um, small town Oklahoma and just do some things that, that most people don't get to do. My wife always calls it redneck Christmas. That's what she calls it. And redneck Thanksgiving. And we do some fun things like that. The truth is I'm, I'm just a country boy at heart. I, I, I know I kind of make fun of you city slickers sometimes, but I'm from the country. It's just the way it is. And, and unless you're from the country, there are certain things you're just not going to get. You're not going to understand. Let me give you a little example here. My hometown had 2,000 people in it, and at least 50 of them were named Bubba. No kidding, all right? It's not just a, a joke. It's, it was for real, 50 people named Bubba. You know, in, in small towns, we say things like, bless your heart, right? We just say things that people don't say. Like, we say britches, right? I grew up saying britches. And you know what's under your britches? Your drawers, Right? These are just things that, that I know some of you aren't going to get tonight, and I'm going to talk about some lingo that you may not get, so I want you to kind of be able to, to hang with me. We do things in, in, the, in the country, too, that people don't do. We go snipe hunting. Anybody ever been snipe hunting? All right, we got some country folk in here. If you haven't been snipe hunting, I'll take you this weekend. It's a lot of fun. You know, where I grew up, we actually only had three digits to our phone number. People would say, what's your number? And we would tell them the last three, 228 because everybody in town had the same first six, right? I mean, and you only needed three more. You wouldn't understand that in the big city, for sure. Interestingly enough, I grew up and we never, my entire life, had a house key. Not at all, one did not exist. Matter of fact, our house and all the houses in town were completely wide open unless it was nighttime and then we would lock the doors. Country life was just different, right? My cousin and I grew up just doing fun stuff. I remember we would sneak away and, and go hunting uh, in the daytime. We would actually um, go out and shoot squirrels and dip snuff, right? You know, that's what you do in the country. And she was a lot better shot than me, for sure. Um, that's a true story. My cousin really was a tom girl. Listen, if you're not from the country, you don't know what a tom girl is, right? City boys do things differently too. City boys go outside to enjoy their morning coffee. In the country, we went outside to get rid of the morning coffee. That's what we did. Some of you will catch that later. Oh, you know what I loved about the country though? The stars. The stars at night. They're not big and bright in Texas. They're big and bright in the country. 
I love the beautiful nights of the country. I, I think the best part about it may be just the peace and quiet, if I'm being honest. The difference in the city life and the country life was probably the peace and quiet. That's why Pastor Kendall's moving to the country, for the peace and quiet and the morning coffee. Sabrina's first visit to our house was an interesting one. Our first visit we, uh, from Oklahoma City, I brought Sabrina down to the country and I brought her there. And on our very first visit, the very first night there, the cows got out and we are literally chasing cows, getting them back in. My mom gets flat plowed over by a cow. I'm sure Sabrina's sitting there as a city girl thinking, what in the heck is this? Yeehaw, literally redneck stuff going on. A lot of things in the country happen that you guys just may not know about. One of my favorite things, right up there with snipe hunting, is something in the country we call cow tipping. Cow tipping! It's a blast! So there's some, some things that people don't understand. Probably some city slicker taught this, but cows actually do not sleep standing up, all right? If you're from the country, you know that, which makes cow tipping all the more fun. What is cow tipping, you say? It's literally what it sounds like. You go out at night with your friends and you find the cows. Now, while they don't sleep standing up, they are in somewhat of a comatose state, chewing on their cud. Some of you city slickers are like, what's cud, right? And so you can kind of sneak up on them. And the goal is to literally tip the cows over. Now, it's a whole lot more fun because you're really not successful at it, all right? It's just the idea. If you can do it, it usually takes more than one, and usually there's some trickery involved. But one night, me and my friend Brian went out, and we, were, we went cow tipping, and we pulled up next to the pasture and jumped the gate, and we go over, and I'm just, we're laughing. Brian's got a full steam. You know, he's going to tip this cow over, right? He downset huts. He football runs toward it, hits the broad side of that cow, falls back over. We're just laughing, you know, decided... He gets up bruised and hurting. We go back to the car, still laughing. We begin to smell something that's kind of like, what is that smell? Brian fell over in a cow patty, for sure. Speaking of that in the country, we used to have cow patty wars. If you never had a cow patty war, you don't know what you're missing out. And the fresher, the better, let me just tell you. Brian had fell in a cow patty while cow tipping. The worst part about it was Brian had a really weak stomach. So we're driving down the road. Now Brian's got to puke, right? I pull over. He's outside puking. Cow poop and puke everywhere. And of course, the county sheriff pulls up, right? Right beside us. Says, boys, what are you doing? Cow tipping? We were like, yeah, yeah, officer, you got us. Cow tipping, what a blast. If you haven't been, I encourage you to do it. I'll probably start a tour guide business. We'll probably get that. That'd probably be successful. I want to talk to you about cow tipping tonight because there's an interesting story in Scripture really about something very similar. Exodus 32 tells us the story of, of Moses on the mountain and, and, and communing with God and getting the instructions for the people of God and, and, and getting the Ten Commandments, literally. And, and it was so much more than that. He was really getting the, the laws and, and how to carry them out and how to, uh, to, to, to go about worship. It was more than just the commandments. But he was up there for at least a month. And, and the people who were down, you remember, they had just came out of Israel or out of Egypt. They had just came out of bondage. They were going to the promised land. And now they're on this, this holdup, you know, Moses says, wait a minute, I got to go up to Mount Sinai and I got to meet with God and you guys just wait right here. And they're waiting for about a month and that brings us to Exodus chapter 32 and you can read along with me. It says this, when the people saw that Moses was so long and coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron, who was Moses's right hand man, and they said, come make us gods. Now I'm going to stop here as we read this a little bit and just, just, call out some things that I find interesting. Number one, they said, come and make us gods. You see, here's one of the problems I think that we as humans have, and sometimes we as people even within the church have, is that we make our own gods, that we create them, that we, that we, we form them, right? And this is exactly what the, the Israelites did. They said, come make us gods. I got to be honest with you tonight. 
I know we do it naturally, but the idea of making something that is greater than I, that something that is worthy of worship, is, is, is a failure from the beginning. You see, no God that didn't make me is worth my worship. Any God that I created is not worthy of worship. Any God that I make would not be God at all. I find it interesting. So make us gods, they say, who will go before us. And then this one just cracked me up. The next verse says this, or that ver- the finishing part of that verse says, as for this fellow Moses, that just kind of struck me. I mean, here's the guy who rescued you from hundreds of years in bondage. Here's the guy who led you out of Egyptian bondage. Here's the guy who did all these miraculous things and you've seen him do these things. And he's been your leader and he's been the one you put your faith in. He literally saved you. And all of a sudden you forget that and you're like, yeah, this fellow Moses, right? Just some guy, this fellow Moses. And they forgot who he was. This, yeah, this fellow who brought us out of Egypt. We don't really know what's happened to him. And Aaron answered, all right, take off all the gold earrings you have, all that your wives, your sons, your daughters are wearing, your jewelry, bring it to me. So the people took off their earrings, brought it to Aaron. He took what they had handed him and he made it into an idol, cast it into the shape of a calf, a golden calf is what scripture tells us. He fashioned it with a tool. And then he said to them, here is your God, Israel. Here is the God we made who brought you out of Egypt. Verse number five, when Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf and announced, tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. I think this is interesting too, because a lot of times we create these gods, then we still give credit to the Lord. Aaron says, I'm gonna make this golden calf, I'm gonna make an altar, and then tomorrow we're gonna celebrate the Lord. Right? And all that the Lord has done By worshiping this golden calf, right? It's kind of like on social media when somebody posts their new $70,000 SUV they got. You know, they live in a $100,000 house, but they bought a $70,000 SUV. And they say, look what God has blessed me with. The Bible says the blessings of God come with no what? Sorrow. (laughs) Some of the things we give God credit for just wasn't his doing. And the, here, here we have the people of God building idols, building this golden calf, and yet still wanting to, interestingly enough, remember the Lord in it. Let me give the Lord his little piece. Tomorrow, Aaron says, we're going to have a festival to the Lord. So the next day, the people rose up, sacrificed burnt offerings, presented fellowship offerings. Afterward, they sat down, ate, drank, and the Bible says indulged in revelry. <laughs> Anybody else ever reveled? I looked up the definition of revelry. Some of you have done it, all right? (laughs) Literally, in this word, in this form, it means to drink, to excess. Usually, it means loud and obnoxious and lots of alcohol. Revelers, for sure. I was a reveler. I get it. Then the Lord said to Moses, go down because your people who you brought out of Egypt has become corrupt. How quickly they have come corrupt. They turned away from me quickly, turned away from what I commanded. They made themselves an idol cast in the shape of a calf. They bowed down to it, sacrificed to it, claiming it to be their God, claiming that it had delivered them. They're stiff necked, Moses, or God says. And he says this, now leave me alone that my anger may burn against them, that I may destroy them. And then I will make you a great nation. This is a little sub note here, a little side sermon, a little bonus message, all right? Sometimes, I I thought it was interesting because I read it wrong. I read that God would destroy them and then make Israel a great nation. And here's what he said. I will destroy them and make you a great nation. Again, bonus message here, not really included in the text, but sometimes God's got to get rid of the people to build you up the people that are bringing you down, the relationships that are corrupting you, the relationships that are holding you back. Sometimes it's when those things are gone that God will build you up. Verse number 11, though, Moses sought the favor of the Lord and he said, Lord, why would your anger burn against God if you if burn against your people? You brought them out of Egypt. Why now would you destroy them? Moses is just pleading for the people now. 
He's saying, God, would you please, would you please? In verse number 14, the Lord relented, did not bring disaster upon the people. Moses instead turned down the mountain with the two tablets of the, of, of the law that were inscribed on both sides, the Ten Commandments. We've all seen the movie. The tablets were the work of God, the writings of him, engraved with the commandments. Joshua heard the noise and thought the people were at war. And Moses says, they're not at war, they're just reveling. And when Moses approached the camp, he saw the calf, he saw the dancing, his anger burned. And the Bible says he threw the commandments down. And in one fell swoop, he broke all 10 commandments at once, right? We've all been there. At least the revelers have. Moses was angry. And then verse number 20 says this, and he took the calf that the people have made and burned it in the fire. He ground it into a powder, scattered it on the water and made the Israelites drink it. Here's what Moses did. He came down. He said, there's some cow tipping that needs to be done. There's some idol moving that needs to happen. There's some destruction of these things that these people are worshiping and it has to be torn down. You see, Moses didn't come down to the calf and say, you know, I see this idol that my people have placed in front of God and man, I just got to get their eyes off of it. I just got to move it, maybe sit it outside the camp somewhere, maybe put it in the closet somewhere. And here's the problem with you and I sometimes and the idols and the golden calves that we have, they're still standing. They're standing in the closet. They're standing in the back of our hearts or the back of our minds. And we put them on the, in the backyard. We put them up on the shelf. And here's what we got to do. We got to tip those things over. We got to destroy those things. Moses tipped the cow and ground it up, melted it, grounded it up. The Bible says, then he sprinkled it on the water and made the Israelites drink it. Listen, sometimes the idols we have don't come down so easy. And sometimes the idols we've set up certainly don't go down so easy. But I have to think that if you ever drink ground up gold, you probably won't build that idol again, will you? Moses knew that this idol that they had built, this image they had built and worshiped, had to be destroyed, had to be taken down, had to be removed. Interestingly enough, verse number 27, because when we build idols, there are consequences. And a lot of times we stop right here. But verse number 27 tells us what really happens and what continues to happen. Then he said to them, this is what the Lord God of Israel says. Each man strap a sword to his side. And, and here's what's happening. Moses is now talking to the people who did not worship the idol. Because what you got to think is out of all of Israel, not everybody was, was on board with this golden calf. Not everybody was signing up for, for this revelry, right? There had to be people sitting back and saying, wait a minute, this isn't right. I know who Moses is. I have not forgotten what God did for us. And Moses finds those people and he gathers those people. He gathers those faithful. And in verse number 27, he says this. This is what the Lord God of Israel says. Each man strap a sword to his side, go back and forth through the camp from one to another, killing his brother and his friend and his neighbor. And verse number 28 says the Levites did as Moses commanded. And that day, about 3,000 people died. Now, now, this is a crazy story. Certainly not one that's politically correct. The Old Testament's full of stuff like this, right? What's the point of that? Why would God destroy 3,000 of his own people? God didn't destroy 3,000 of his own people. A golden calf destroyed 3,000 of God's people. God didn't destroy 3,000 of his own people. A lack of faith destroyed him. A lack of patience destroyed destroyed him. A lack of vision destroyed him. It wasn't God who made them worship and revel and, and, and build this false idol. It was their own desire. Now, how does this relate to you and I today? I want to go back to 1 John 2, 15. It says this, do not love the world or anything in it. If we love the world, and here's what John 2, 15, 1 John 2, 15 is talking about. It's talking about idols. It's talking about the golden calves we have in our life. And it says this, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but the world. See, here's the idols that we all build. Here's the idols that we all have. Number one, pleasure. 
First John 2 15 calls it this lust of the flesh, but it's simply pleasure. Pleasure for many people in a, and many people within the body of Christ today, unfortunately, is an idol. S- giving in to the things of the flesh, the desires of the flesh, the sinful nature, pleasure. You know, if, if we're being honest, <laughs> we do more pleasure than we do work and worship. And there's nothing wrong with a little pleasure until your pleasure becomes a golden calf that you're worshiping. That you're dancing to and reveling. I'm not talking about dancing here. Okay, I'm talking about reveling, all right? But the golden calf of pleasure that, that we worship to, that we put up in place of our God. When pleasure becomes our source of fulfillment, doesn't mean pleasure can't be fulfilling. When pleasure becomes our place of rescue, doesn't mean we all don't need a break and to get away and do something fun. But when pleasure becomes the golden calf that now we put in place of God, it's an idol. Pleasure. The second one is possessions. 1 John 2, 15 calls it the lusts of the eyes. But many times, worldly things, not just pleasurable, but possession of things, Stuff, literally. And not not just stuff, because we all like stuff, right? And we all like things. I like things as much as the next person. But as a person who's an addict by nature, I have to be really careful because I'm just being honest. Sometimes my things can become golden calves. Sometimes the the, the materialistic, I I like stuff. I'm just being open and transparent with you tonight. I have to be really careful and not love this world too much. Doesn't mean I can't love the world, but if I make a golden calf out of it and worship at it and and, and put my hope and my strength and my, my, if it's my go-to place, if it's my priority, now even a possession has become a lust of the eyes. Coveting what somebody else has can be an idol. And then lastly, pride. Pride itself, 1 John 2.15 tells us, is an idol that we all built. You see, the Israelites built this golden calf. Here's why, because it satisfied the five senses. That's what I believe. I think a big part of it was it just satisfied the senses. They wanted something they could see, something they could touch, something that was tangible. They wanted something that they could grab hold of. And a lot of times, if we're being honest in the faith, we struggle with this too. We want a God that we can see and touch and something that we can grab hold on. Why is, why is it that the Israelites did this? The truth is because they lacked faith. They had also been in, is, in Egypt a really long time. And you know what they did in Egypt? In Egypt, they built gods for everything. In Egypt, it was nothing to see a golden calf. So interestingly enough, the Israelites just went back to what they knew went back to what worked for everybody. They went back to a place where faith wasn't required, where faith in a God they couldn't see, touch, or hold, a faith in a God they might not hear from for a month. How many of us as Christians have not heard from God in a while and we lose faith? How many of us have not had that experience with God in a while and and we lose faith? And guess what we do after that? We Build a golden calf, that's what we do. When do we build idols? All of us do it. I want to give you some quick things tonight, three things that I think will help us remember how not to do it. Because this is when we usually build idols in our life. Number one, just like the Israelites, when we forget where we came from. When we forget where God has brought us from, when we forget the deliverance we had, we begin to build idols. I forgot for a moment in my life the deliverance that God gave to me when I was younger. I'd forgotten how entangled I was in my own revelry. And when I forgot what God had did for me, you see, when I first started my early years of preaching, when I was 20, 21 years old, 1995, June, first sermon I ever preached, guess what was a big part of my ministry? 
what God had done for me in delivering me from alcohol, what God had done for me in setting me free from that. It was a big part of my testimony, big part of my story. But at some point along the way, I forgot what I had been set free from. And I began to build up idols in my life. The second time that we all build idols is when we fight where we're at right now. When we forget where we came from and when we fight where we're at. When we, as the Israelites, get impatient. We want the answer right now. We want, we want to hear from God right now. We want deliverance right now. Three years ago when I came to this church, I hated the struggle I was in. I just, I hated the struggle. I hated the place I was in. I couldn't see any value in going through what I had done. I couldn't see any value in the difficulty I was facing. And a lot of times you're going through hard things and you're going through struggles. And the truth is you don't see the value in it. You don't want to go through it. You don't want to be long suffering as scripture calls us to. And you fight where you're at right now. I'm not saying that we shouldn't pray the prayer of faith and believe for God to deliver us. I'm not saying that we shouldn't pray for God to take us to the next place. But what I am saying is sometimes God has you where you're at for a reason. And you're so focused on going somewhere else. You're missing what he's doing right now. We want the next big thing. Why people go from one church to the other in America. The vast majority of church growth, now this isn't freedom, but the vast majority of church growth in America is not us out there reaching new people. It's just people moving from one church to the other. Why? Just fighting where they're at now. Unsatisfied, looking for the next best thing. Not knowing what it is to be content where the Lord has you not knowing what it's like to be patient. And we just fight where we're at. Whether it's our job, our relationship, our marriage, we just fight it. Just moving on. And we build idols. And the last thing is this. When we fail to work toward where we're going, this is what the Israelites did. They forgot where they had been they were fighting against where they were and they took their eyes off the promised land. They forgot where they were going and they stopped working toward it and they stopped working together and they failed to see the big picture and they failed to begin to do the things they needed to do today to help them take a step they would need to take tomorrow. And when we don't work toward following God and seeking God and growing in God and improving, guess what we do? We build idols. We set ourselves up for that. I didn't want to work to get back into ministry three years ago. I didn't want to work to, to, to get out of where I was. I didn't want to work toward the future. The truth is, I, I, I had some idols. I had some, some golden calves in my life. Number one, When I first came through this three years ago and got arrested, for those of you who don't know my story, pastored for 20 years, got arrested June 15th, 2018, Father's Day weekend for drunk driving. Two days later, I resigned from my church and, well, here I am. It wasn't easy. But when this, when this started, I had put my faith into these golden calves that I had, and one of them was my church. The first thing that hit my mind, and my wife can tell you, I cried and talked and begged and, and tried everything. God, I can't lose my church. I can't lose this church that I'm pastoring. And it wasn't because I didn't want to just lose the church. I'm going to be honest with you tonight. It was because I thought, who again will ever hire a pastor who got arrested, a failure, a drunk? If these people won't have me, nobody will. That was my thought process. Here's what I was really saying, God, the only way you can ever use me again is this church. You know what God said? Man, I got to tip that cow. I got to get rid of that calf. I, I'm going to grind it up and make you drink it. And guess what? I lost my church. 
Well, then I thought, all right, I lost my church. That's all right. I belong to the Assemblies of God. And, and man, it is a vast network nationwide, worldwide of churches. I got connections. I got friends. I got pastors. I got people who will let me in. If, as long as I can keep my minister credentials, my ordination with the Assemblies of God, as long as I can keep that, I'll be all right. Because then, man, whew, at least I can, you know, there's a way, right? There's a way. And you know what God said? That's the golden calf, son. And I'm going to have to tear it down. And I had to be okay with losing that. If that's what God wanted to do. You see, I couldn't see any other way around it except my way. Except the familiar way. Except, for me, the easy way. I didn't think God could do it unless he did it like this. And then the last golden cap for me was, okay, God, whatever happens, I got to be able to minister. I got to be, I got to, I got to preach. I got to do it, right? And for me, that may have been the greatest golden cap of all. And it was an idol. And I promise you today, I wouldn't be standing where I am right now, except for about two years ago, I came to God and I said, okay, God, tip that cow. If I never preach again, it's okay. Because you're enough. You're enough. See, God says, I will have no other gods before me. No idols, no golden calves, none of that. I had to be okay with losing everything and all the idols in my life. I want to ask the worship team if they would to come back at this time. The truth is tonight, many of us have these idols, these, these golden calves, literally. For some, it may be your job. It has become a, 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 a job should be important to us. It should be something we do. It's more than a vocation. In some senses, it's a mission field. Maybe God's place is there to reach people. At its core, it is a provision, not just for our family, but also ultimately the family of God, because we do further the gospel through the blessings of a job and through the monetary gains we have there and supporting the church and supporting missions. So I get that. But for many people, their job has become their source. It has become their idol. It has become their hope. It has become their identity. It has become their safe place. For some people, it's a relationship. I, I'm almost determined. I hate that the, I hate that the, the divorce rate in the church is, is so high. But I'm going to be honest. If God says, I, you can have no other gods before me. I understand this. God hates divorce. We all get it, right? That's not his ultimate plan. But he also hates golden calves. And if you have made your spouse into a god, guess what? Naturally, that thing's going to tip. If you have made your children or your hobbies or your finances or your future or your possessions or your pleasures or your pride, in my case, if, if you've made yourself, we can joke about Allie's t-shirt, but the, the honest truth is I was the president of the I Love Kelly fan club. Selfish. I was self-centered. I was in the center of it all. I, self had become a golden calf. An idol for me. More than even God was. But here's the truth. When we get to the place where no matter what we're going through, no matter what we're facing, no matter how long it's been, no matter how distant God may be, no matter when we get to the place that God is all we need, then guess where you're at? You're at a place where God is all you need. I don't need this, which for me was security and safety, familiarity and, and comfort. I don't need this. I just need to trust in you, God. I don't need my way. I don't need my plans. I just need to trust in you, God. 
When God is all you need, He's all you need.